All right, everybody, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, my name is Serena Lau, and I am with the San Francisco Bay Bird Observatory, or SFBBO for short. If you're not familiar with us, we are a small nonprofit organization based in Milpitas, California, and our mission is to promote sustainability in the Bay Area and beyond by engaging communities with uh, avian science, habitat conservation, and education. Uh, we do most of our work throughout the South San Francisco Bay Area, and that is primarily on Wakma Ohlone land, so we do want to acknowledge that. And tonight, we are really excited to partner with John Muir Laws for this program on how to draw the Great Blue Heron. So many of you probably are familiar with Jack's work, but in case you aren't, he is a scientist, educator, and author who helps people forge a deeper and more personal connection with nature through keeping illustrated nature journals and understanding science. He has been trained as a wildlife biologist and as an associate of the California Academy of Sciences, and he observes the world with rigorous attention and uh, teaches skills in observation, curiosity, and creative thinking. He's the founder of the Nature Journal Club on Facebook, as well as the Wild Wonder Nature Journaling Conference, which is an annual event that gathers people who are passionate about nature, art, science, curiosity, and wonder. And he also does a ton of other activities, and you can find out all about that on his website as well. Um, he has also written and illustrated several books, including How to Teach Nature Journaling, The Law's Guide to Nature Journaling, uh, or Nature Drawing and Journaling, and uh, The Law's Guide to Drawing Birds, and so many other books as well. So you can also find those on his website too. So we asked him to do this program on Great Blue Herons, not only because there are these big, beautiful, majestic birds that a lot of people, especially throughout North America, have experienced, but also because they're one of the main species that SFBBO monitors as part of our colonial water bird program. So I wanna talk a little bit about that and what we do with these birds, how we're studying them. So colonial water birds are birds that feed or nest on the water um, and they breed in groups with, or colonies. Um, and these colonies can include one or multiple species. So in the case of the great blue herons here in the Bay Area, they tend to like to nest among themselves, but every, every so often we'll see them nesting with great egrets, um, or sometimes double-crested cormorants will move in to the same trees that they're nesting in. And nearby, we'll also see other uh, nesting colonial water birds, including snowy egrets and black crowned night herons as well. So um, for our colonial water bird program, this is uh, one of our longest running programs, our longest running science programs. It started back in 1982 to, of course, monitor nesting water bird colonies. And that's not just because we enjoy the birds and we want to know how they're doing. We wanna see if they're having breeding success, but also because they are indicators of environmental health. By paying attention to birds like the great blue herons and how they're doing, they clue us in to how the ecosystem is doing as a whole and how the environment is doing. And that of course is important for humans and every other living thing that we share the environment with. Now, this Colonial Water Bird Program is possible thanks to the help of volunteers. So citizen scientists or community scientists uh, have been helping us monitor birds throughout the Bay Area. And so over the years, we've engaged hundreds of people in helping us collect data on these birds. In addition, a lot of these colonies are in urban areas or public places. And so when we're monitoring birds out there, it also gives us a really good opportunity to engage the public with the birds that are here and get them to support conservation as they become more familiar with the nature that exists here. In addition, with the data that we collect, we are able to share that with land managers, agencies, and other conservation organizations so that we can help support the conservation and management of these species. So that is all thanks to the scientists and the volunteers that help collect all of this data over the last 40 plus years. So here uh, is a map that shows where we've had great blue heron colonies throughout the Bay Area. So this represents 58 unique colonies. Now in any given year, we'll typically have about 15 to 20 active colonies. Um, and that's also a good sign because 
it, it tells us that the, the great blue herons have been relatively stable over the years. So it hasn't really dropped a whole lot so far. Um, and so that's, that's a good sign for our herons. Um, we also see anywhere between one nest in a given colony. Um, so it's not really much of a colony, right, if they're by themselves. But some colonies have up to 30 nests. So it does have a range there. So uh, again, what we're seeing is relatively good news for the great blue herons. That's not necessarily the case for all of the colonies that we monitor. Um, for example, we see that stilts and avocets and tern colonies have been declining over the years. Um, but other birds like California gulls and double crested cormorants have been increasing over the years. So this is an example of some of the data that we get from these uh, from this colonial waterbird program. And so not only that, but we're also monitoring some other trends that we're beginning to see. So from this data, we're able to see when these birds are starting their breeding seasons. And some of our volunteers have been monitoring birds for over 20 years. Um, and some of them have noticed that some of them are starting to breed earlier and earlier, which could be an indication of, of responses to climate change, for example. So it's something that we're monitoring. Um, another thing that we're seeing from some of our volunteers is that some colonies will become abandoned mid-season, and we don't always know the reasons for that. It could be other species moving in or other factors that cause them to abandon those. But again, by having this data, we're able to monitor this. And it really goes to show that it's really important to have this long-term data collection to, to really monitor these, pro these birds and see how they're doing over time. So that's what I wanted to share about what we are seeing with great blue herons here in the Bay Area. And so I am really excited to learn how to draw these birds with John Muir Laws here and uh, further increase our collective appreciation for these wonderful birds. So Jack, I would like to hand things over to you to get started here. Well, thank you so much. I am delighted to be here with all of you and with San Francisco Bay Breeding Bird Observatory. Um, and uh, we're gonna have a lot of fun with herons today. Um, it, the, the work that the uh, uh, SF Bay Bird Observatory is doing is really, really important to help us understand and conserve and protect these birds. So I want to send a shout out to that organization and also encourage people to find what organizations in your area are doing local research to help us understand and protect these species. Because good science means good practices for conservation. And it's really important that those two things go hand in hand. We as human beings, just with the kind of intuitive ways we think, can get ourselves into a lot of trouble. Um, but uh, science gives us a fighting chance in making good management decisions. And so really want to uh, appreciate the work that the San Francisco Bay Bird Observatory is doing. And happy to be here with all of you tonight. I am going to jump bounce over to um, a screen share. I am going to be on the left hand side showing you some slides on the right hand side. I'm going to be uh, sketching and drawing the things that we see. Um, so I'm going to be uh, showing you pictures on the left. Most of them come from the website birdpixel.com and I want to send a special shout out to my friend Vivek Kanzode for um, allowing me to use those. A few other pictures I have scavenged from other sources and sites, but uh, um, thank you for, especially uh, to uh, Vivek for letting me use those, those pictures. All right, I am going to be doing some drawing and sketching right down here. And um, that's going to help us be able to draw what we see. So to be able to, to draw the, the, the herons, I'm going to be going over a little bit of anatomy of these birds. Not because, um, well, it's, it's going to really help you understand how to put these birds together because they are, they are, there's a few kind of critical points 
And if you get those, your herons will, will, will really feel like herons. When I first started drawing herons, I would have these birds that, you know, had kind of a beak sticking out and then they had a hose coming down and then, then a bird's body. And the, uh, I, I've drawn a lot of herons with kind of fire hose um, necks. And the idea of how this head fits into the bodies was also really confusing to me. Um, I, originally, I sort of <laughs> stick them in like a, um, um, imagine a, a, a human neck coming into a body. But we're going to we're going to take a really closer look here. We're going to investigate the head. Then we're going to work our way down the neck. We're going to take that neck and attach it to the body. And then we're going to look at the body and the wings, because if you've drawn a lot of songbirds, you're going to be initially confused by what you're seeing when you're looking at that that heron wing. Um, but once you've got that, it's going to it's going to really help you be able to 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 quickly sketch what you, you see and at the very end we're going to be looking at how to make a bunch of fast gesture sketches of a heron that is moving around and perhaps 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 hunting a fish or maybe even a gopher so let's start by looking at that head there's a beautiful beautiful heron head and I want to point out just a couple of details about this that are going to help you be able to draw it. So um, every heron out there is going to be a little bit different. They are as individual as as human beings are. But if I if I know a few little points of its anatomy. Um, that are kind of generalizable across a lot of different birds. It's going to help me kind of quickly get down what I see. So let's start with with a head and I'm going to to lightly sketch that in with this little purple pencil here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with just kind of a, 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 a light line down the middle of my bird's head. Imagine this kind of going down the beak. And then I'm going to look at for my the, the the width of my head, my head is this big. How long is this beak going to be? So if you look over on the picture here, perhaps you can see my cursor wiggling around there. So if my head is this big, if I stop here, if I put another head in, it goes to about here, and then I've got a little bit more. So using your head length, as a measuring tool on your beak is going to help you get those proportions. So I'm going to go out another little head length and then add in a little bit more. And that's roughly going to help me get those those proportions. Now I'm going to put in a ball here where my bird's head is. And I'm going to put in Kind of a chunky beak. Don't make your beak, don't make your beak too thin, or it will feel mm, more like a like a snowy egret. Now, the eye. Here's this line down the middle. Imagine the sort of beak coming back here into the head. The eye is going to be below that line and above the line of the mouth. So if you're drawing a lot of ducks, you know, they have these high eyes. But the idea of this eye here is that this eye ends up sighting down the top of the beak. So all this bird has to do is look at something and it has its beak lining up with it. So um, lots of birds that peck for a living are set up this way. And <clears throat> this bird is no exception. So my eye is going to be in here. And let's take a, a little look at how the beak then attaches into this ball of a head. Because if I'm doing it this way, here's my ball and then here's my beak sticking out, you kind of get this effect of kind of looks like a carrot stuck into a snowball. And but 
to, to get your, your, your head to attach, what we're going to do is we're going to, on this top part here where the eye is, the skin is actually going to go a little bit behind the eye and sort of back to the corner of the mouth so that this, this eye is not actually in feathers. It's on the hard surface of the beak. And on the lower jaw, on the lower mandible here, the feathers are going to fluff out much further onto this, this bill. So if you notice that this is coming down here at about the same distance out, we have this. I'm going to quickly switch to a different bird. Oh, let's see. You notice the same thing here on this bird. Here's the front of the beak coming up. And that little poochy part on the lower bill comes to the same distance. But now look at what is underneath the bill. This is huge for making your bird look, um, look right. About halfway out this beak, I have this zone of little white feathers that are coming out underneath the head of the bird. So I'm going to come back here. Give this bird kind of a, a rounded back here. So that's me blocking this bird in. And I then have a, its neck will be kind of looking at that neck. This is kind of a big pile of its neck coming up right below here. That's my, my basic lines for, for blocking this bird in. If I'm doing it smaller and fast here, um, my bird basically has its head is going to be looking in this direction. It's going to have a head here and its beak is going to come out about this far. Eye, the lower beak. You know, that, that helps me block in that basic shape. Now I'm going to draw over this with, I've got a, a, a mechanical pencil here with some dark lead in it. And what I'm going to do is um, draw a little bit more carefully and deliberately over these guidelines. But because I've already blocked in the shape of how big things are, it's going to be easier for me to draw now. So I'll very often when I'm drawing, first block in the basic shape and then work in more careful details over that. And coming along this upper surface of the beak, I can make a nice kind of clean, deliberate line. And it is going to be straighter than the one that is going to come on the lower bill. On the lower bill, um, on the lower bill, I'm going to come down at a little bit more of an angle and then back. So there's a different shape down here than there is up here. This is much flatter. There's a little nostril hole up here in the top part of the bill. And what I'm going to do is draw a little line and put a few little kind of hatch marks in like this, sort of suggesting that little depression. Now, here I've got these feathers that stick into here. This area kind of piles up sometimes, give you some just sort of suggest that that comes in here. Very often when I'm ending a line into a mass of feathers, I'll make a little line that kind of comes down. And instead of abruptly stopping like that, I'll often kind of give it, you know, a, kind of peter it out. Or if it is kind of coming in like this, I can make just out of a few, it kind of lightly fuzzes that line out. On the top of the forehead here, so see if I put this kind of hard line in here, you, you might think that this bird has a hard head like a bowling ball, but I want this to look like it's made out of feathers. So what I'm going to do 
is I'm going to, those, these feathers are laying back this way. I'm gonna put a few little kind of flick marks. So starting my pencil in here, I press it a little bit harder and I flick down into here. Press and I flick down. And that kind of just sort of roughens up that edge and makes it, you know, be a more possible that it is a, uh, you know, it's, it's soft feathers. The skin here, it's going to ground my eye. I'm going to look at the eye shape. And what, very often when I look, this is, this is subtle, but is the eye totally round? It's actually not. There's a little bit of, here's the exaggerated thing. <clears throat> there actually are slight points on it. And so what I want to think, think about is if I can find where those points are, where and draw a line between them, is it an angle like this? Is it an angle like that? On this one, I've got on the eye a point that is a little bit higher here and a little bit through here. So there's a little bit. So that's what I'm going to be doing when I'm drawing this eye here. I want to get. Just a little, very kind of subtle hint of that. And then in putting in this pupil, I'm going to put it slightly closer to the front than to the back. People are going to really look at the eye very, very carefully on any drawing you do. So a little bit more attention to that is going to go really serve you well. Slightly darken the area around the outside edge of this. And then if I just have the eye sitting on this beak, it's going to feel a little bit unnatural. So I notice that there's a little bit of an eyelid. I'm going to hint that in and around the eye. And again, rather than just going a hard line like that around the eye, what I'm doing is my line is going to kind of stutter out. Kind of a consistently inconsistent line. Some places I can make that a little bit harder and more continuous. But that's going to sort of help give it an organic feel. If I had a line that just went hard around that, it would feel more mechanical. So then my feathers work their way around this. They're going to scoop down below that eye. And then the, the mouth kind of turns down slightly here, and I can get that in. So I have a, um, a little black stripe above the eye here. And first I'm going to put in the white area above that, that bottom edge, just to make sure. That there's enough room for it. And that is feeling pretty good on sort of an initial blocked in head. Let's take a look at what else these birds can do. In breeding season, you can get really dramatic colors out here in the bill. 
And if the wind's blowing from behind them or they're feeling frisky, they'll erect a crest on top of their head. And so when you're uh, putting in a crest like that, you want to think of where are those feathers originating from. Imagine that there's a skull in here. So these feathers are So this bird, I think, is, has some wind blowing in on it. If I were drawing that in, I would want to think of these as big chunks of feathers kind of overlapping with each other, kind of like that. So these feathers here can so I'm going to give this bird a little bit of white on the top of its head because I want to suggest that there is this is a stripe on the side. If you look at the heron from the front, you can see there's a little white stripe that comes down the middle. Now, if we start to make our way down the bird's body, we get to the neck. And this is the pose that you'll see lots of these birds in. They kind of come to rest and they'll tuck their necks down and in. Um, it is drawing the neck of the heron is what a, a major thing that confuses people. So we want to think of how does the head attach to the neck and then what does the neck do? And how do I sketch that? So the bird has a long neck. This is a bird that has just taken off or is about to land. Usually when they fly, they have their neck all curled up. So <laughs> this one is trying to confuse people and make people think that is it's a crane right? flying along here. This is the, the crane flying position. Um, herons. <laughs> don't do this. So this one did not get the memo, right? Um, but how they curl up is really weird and really interesting. So I want you just to take a look here at the, the angles and curves in this neck. And notice there's this little V behind the head here. And the head is attaching on the bottom of the body. And I want you to also notice in the front edge, down here there's a curve, but there are these really sharp angles on the front of the neck. So the neck is has a very, very cool shape. And it's actually designed uh, a little bit like an atlatl. So an atlatl um, or a trebuchet, which is a kind of a catapult, work on the same mechanism, where there is a throwing lever or a little throwing lever that you hold, and that's going to whip another piece around it. And this allows you to, to get a spear or a rock that you're catapulting to go much, much, much further. So... Um, let's take a look at the skeleton and see what it is doing. So the spine comes down the back of our friend. And then there's a particularly long vertebrae that cuts across the neck. So you see these ones are all on the back. This then cuts across the neck to the front. And then the spine continues down the front. So right at that spot there, both the esophagus, which is this sort of tube with rings on it, I mean, th that's the trachea, and the esophagus is this sort of gray line coming down here. Um, it crosses over in the trachea. The air tube has these little rings around it so it doesn't collapse. They both cross over on the uh, 
they both cross over in the middle here. So notice on the back, on the you start with the bones on the back, and then where it turns, there is this particularly sharp angle back here, comes to the front. Now there's a particularly sharp angle in the front, and we are curving the bones curve around the front. So there's bones with a gentle curve in front of it, and over here is there's bones with a gentle curve behind it. Let's just make a little diagram of that because I'm going to attach this at the back. So here's here's my skull. I'm going to attach this to the back of my head. Then I'm going to cut across and I'm going to come down the front. And this is where the atlatl comes in. So the atlatl, you have a throwing stick with a little hook and you put your projectile point into that and you hold this part down here and you flick that forward. You flick this piece forward and that's going to shoot your projectile forward. So if this piece here flicks forward, then um, that's going to take this upper part of the neck and jam it forward with even more force, power, and speed. So this is this is your little atlatl mechanism right there. And because of that, you're typically going, typically going to see kind of a gentle curve down the front. And then we step in, and there's a gentle curve curve on this side, so an angle right there. We then get an angle on the other side, and the neck continues down. So this is where we want to kind of start to fight against the garden hose effect, right? Where it's just this little curve. So there's going to be or people will put will will get all flamingo with it. Flamingos just have all these just sort of no, not like that at all. Um, <laughs> flamingos don't do this, um, but flamingos have have all these gentle curves on their neck. The herons and egrets have these sharp angles, and they're going to be closer to the top of the neck than the bottom of the neck. So um, I'm going to have more neck down below than I down below this inflection point than I have above it. Let's take a look at somebody retracting their neck. Right. So follow the same part down and so to see like this part here that's that part there that's that part there right so i can observe that there's a smaller part on the top and a longer part on the bottom with angles in the front and an angle in the back but how do i go about drawing that this is where negative shapes come in negative shapes are your best friend if you are a sketcher. And what a negative shape is, well, first let me define a positive shape. A positive shape is the shape of the bird's neck. The negative space, the negative shape, is the shape of the air that is right next to the neck. And so what I will do is, if I'm drawing something, one of these little critters, I can give myself just sort of a little kind of cartoon head like that. And, but then I'm paying attention to the negative shape that comes down the neck. And how is it going to, what is the shape of the back of the neck? So this isn't a line down the middle of the neck. This is, I'm trying to draw the back of the neck. And then in front of the head, there is also a negative shape there. And I'm going to, it's going to come down, then it's going to come out.
gets a little bit thicker towards the bottom. But I want to look at that as a shape and this as a shape. And particularly if there are any places where there's a little bit more of an inflection point, I want to look for those and be sure to put them in. Now, the danger of drawing something this way is I'm going to now let's let's do that second bird. We're going to come down, angle corners. And here I'm just looking at what is the shape of the air behind it. There's this cool little puzzle piece that sticks in here. But the danger of, of doing this approach, and now I'm going to look at the negative shape in front, is that sometimes if you put them too close together, even though your shape is right, it's not going to feel, it's not going to feel right because it looks kind of like twiggy here. So if I don't want the twiggy effect, what do I do so I don't make this mistake? So what I do is I think of this as three steps. Step number one is, um, here's my little head. Step one is let's get that negative shape behind your head. So it's going to come over. It's going to come down at an angle. It's going to step in a little bit and then have a curve. It then is going to come up onto the back there. Now, I'm going to look at the thickness of this head. And I'm just going to give myself a few little dots that are going to help suggest to me to keep the thickness of this neck. Now, if you put in a whole bunch of dots, then what you will automatically do is play dot to dot and you'll follow your dots. We're not doing that. These dots are just spacers. So if a small number of spacers, so you're not tempted to do dot to dot is what you want. The more dots you put in, I used to put in more dots and then I started to find I was just following my dots instead of looking at the negative shape. I'm going to give my bird a little bit of the underside of its head. Then I am going to curve. I'm going to come up. See, I didn't hit my dot exactly, and that's okay. Um, I'm, they're just there to kind of suggest to me to be careful in not making this thing too skinny. And I'm going to trim this in here. So a few dots, and you've got spacers, too many dots, and you're, you'll just follow those without really looking at the bird. So that helps me get my neck. And now we're going to attach that neck onto the body. So let's look at what happens here. Is the spine, here's the back of the bird. Um, this, is, this is a x-ray of a heron who has been shot. Somebody took a shotgun. See these little silver pellets in here? They missed the egg, fortunately. Um, but this bird was bought into a rehab place because somebody had taken a pot shot at it. Now that we see the spine coming up here, and then it drops down and curves up this way. So it kind of, it's not coming up the middle of the neck. It's coming up the front of the neck. Let's look at another view of that. See, it's coming down here. And then it's gonna come out the front of the neck. And um, 
that little space in here then gets covered up by feathers. So here's that. Uh, let, let's uh, go back here. We see that, imagine that spine coming up across and then coming out the front up across and it's coming out the front so i'm going to think of the body of this thing essentially like a little sort of long ellipse shape if i want to um want to think of that as as a three-dimensional form so Imagine kind of the, the cut it in half line swinging across here. So I've got a big kind of egg for my body. Most of this is going to be covered by the bird's wing. So most of this egg gets covered by the bird's wing. So let's think about the parts of the wing and see what we're actually seeing. Because this this gets confusing. Because if you've if you've if you're one of my friends who's studied bird wings, you're used to your songbird wing when it's folded up kind of looking like this. There's a front edge and there is a pile of secondary feathers that goes across that. And the top part of those secondary feathers has rows of covert feathers on it. So feathers that are bigger and then medium and then smaller and then there's this wedge of primary feathers that stick out so here's my secondary feathers there's usually one two three here and then there's a whole pile of feathers that are the same length some small primary covert feathers in here and then i have another set of you know primary feathers out like this so this is this sort of box sort of simplify it this way. We're used to seeing sort of a box of secondary feathers with a little wedge of primary feathers sticking out from underneath that. The top part of these, uh, these secondary feathers have covert, rows of covert feathers on them. So what are we looking at here with this, uh, with this wing? These, this gray part on top, those are your secondary covert feathers. Those are the feathers that cover up the top part of the, 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 the wing. So if I kind of go back from those, these black things sticking out the bottom, those are my secondary feathers. And then this wedge here of feathers that are fanned, those are the primaries. So I'm going to make a little diagram of this over here. Typically on a wing, you can divide it into two sections. There's the outer part of the wing, and then there's the inner part of the wing. The front part of a bird's wing has a little pad of feathers over it here. So these are covert feathers over the primaries, and then you get covert feathers over the secondaries. So these are secondaries, these are primaries. These are primary coverts and secondary coverts. And then the secondaries are coming straight down like this. And the primary feathers are fanned. Like that. So then this part here, I'm gonna cover, color this black that's this little part here that I'm covering, coloring black here. And those often stick out underneath the wing. But, so now let's kind of go over here again. 
here are my primary feathers, the parts that I covered colored black. These are my primary coverts, this little nugget above those. The secondary coverts are the gray part. And the secondary feathers, you can see those coming out straight here. The last few feathers here on the secondaries, if you look carefully, they're gray. That will end up being relevant in just a moment. So these black secondary coverts coming in here, and then the last few are gray. This bird is a young one. So you can note, you notice it's got an old black top of its head. If it were an adult, there would be two strips on the side with a white part in the middle of them. This bird's feathers are just starting to grow in, but it has its wings all folded up. And here's the crazy thing. From this view, what I'm seeing here is a big block. These gray feathers are all covert feathers. So there's the biggest row, the greater coverts, the median coverts, the lesser coverts here. These covert feathers on the secondaries are most of what you see in the wing of the bird. So this is coverts. This little bump down here, do you remember those last little feathers that were gray in here. When this wing folds up, all these feathers can tuck in underneath those. And that's what we're seeing here. Those are the last few feathers right in here. They actually get a little bit shorter. And they're called tertials. Sort of a fancy name for the last few slowly getting shorter secondary feathers. So a big pile of secondaries, and then at the end of them, you have these tertials, which sometimes give you this one, two, three effect. So those are tertials also. These are the tertials here. But color-wise, this is black. These are black. And then those tertials are gray. So there's a little pad of tertial feathers sticking out underneath the edge of these covert feathers. So that when the wing is all folded up, what you're seeing here is a big block of secondary coverts on the side of the bird. Where are my secondaries? They're folded up and hidden underneath these tertials. Where are my primaries? They're folded up and hidden underneath these secondary coverts. You can see a little bit of the primaries right here. You see that little dark line there? That's a little bit of primaries stuck underneath them. So what we're seeing here is a big block of secondary coverts on the side of this bird. This is crazy because we're used to seeing, you know, on, on, your, on a regular bird, on a regular passerine, the secondary coverts are only this part here. And then you see all the secondaries. Here, my secondaries are hiding underneath these tertials, these tertials here, which are not very big. These are hiding, and then these are all folded up and hiding as well. Another thing that you're seeing is that above these is this strange black spot. Depending on how the bird is holding its wing, this black spot will be bigger or smaller, but it's regularly seen on the side of the heron. What is that black spot? I used to think that it was the top of the wing. All right, let me uh, notice like here, we're not seeing that. Oh my gosh, what happened to your black spot? Well, let's go back to this flying bird. 
to, let's go back to this flying bird. Yep, look at that. See that black spot right there? That's a black spot that is on the side of the bird's chest. And when this wing folds up, you often see part of that black spot above the wing. There's that black spot, there's that black spot, there's that black spot. This whole pad here is the secondary coverts. And I'm not seeing the primaries, I'm not seeing the secondaries. This little pad back here, this little pad back here, those are my tertials. Because one, two, three. So what does this mean for my standing there bird? Here's another bird. This whole section here, these are secondary coverts. Notice that there's this weird stringy stuff on the top. Right, stringy stuff on the top. There's that little black spot on the side of the bird, so that's the wing folding up adjacent to that. Let's take this ball of the body of a bird. And let's put our wing on the side of it. So the wing is covered up by these back feathers and scapular feathers. So there's a pad, there's in underneath these, the, the feathers that are up here, there's a pad of feathers that are going to cover up the top part of that wing. So on your wing, you get, there's this top cover part, but the bottom edge of that is shaggy. Then I have my wing that is going to tuck underneath that. And my tertial feathers are going to make a tapering pad out below that. Remember that spine that came up and then went across and then came out the front of the bird? That means I'm going to, in the back here, have this little shelf. My body turns down. And my head is going to insert in a broad cone across here. In an adult with breeding feathers, these feathers across here are really long, as you're seeing in this one. And then I might see a little bit of the bird's belly feathers down here. In addition to that, I might see part of its leg sticking down. And I'm just gonna draw a leg here. You'll see kind of a little thigh pantaloon section of feathers that comes down that is often red-brown. And then you'll see the leg stick out. There is, a, it widens into a joint and then narrows again into the lower part of the leg. And if you can see here, there's just grass, right? But if you can see the, the toes, you'll see one toe going back with a claw on the end. You'll see three toes going forward. Here in this side view, I'm kind of lining those up. So I'm going to have this joint that bends backwards. And you think that this is like the opposite of our knee, but it actually isn't a knee. 
This is a heel. This bird has a knee that is up here inside. There's a short little uh, femur up in here. It goes into its hip. So it's got a knee, it has a heel, and then these are toe bones down here. So when this bird moves its leg, think of that, how your foot would bend. And that's why birds have these strange backwards pointing knees. They're actually normal pointed heels. So let's put all these ideas together and draw a bird. You're walking along, oh, there's a bird out there. There's a, there's, there's a heron stalking in this meadow right next to you, right? You just come down off your restoration site onto Chrissy Field and oh, wow, there's a heron standing right in front of you. And you go, game on, I'm gonna sketch you. Well, how do I do that? How do I even start? I know all these little bits of its anatomy. Maybe I could draw a head. Well, they, you can do that. You can just make a sketch of the head if you want to. But let's say you wanted to draw this whole thing. Here's how I would go about it, right? I would first, just lightly loosely draw the air behind the bird all right and on this one it comes down makes a little bump like that so i draw the air that i see behind the bird and then what i'm going to do is kind of start to now bring in some of my anatomy ideas to help me be able to and other drawing ideas to help me be able to draw what I see here. So I'm going to now look at this negative space that is I'm going to give myself a few spacers right um, the little negative space that is in front of this bird. So by the negative space I mean what is the shape of the air right there. It's curving around like that. And then what is the negative space behind this bird? Well, it does this, but I can also kind of pull that into here. Now, let's imagine this as a big oval body. You know, imagine the the these little edges of the those 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 thin plumes on the side of this thing coming right in there. I'm gonna have my back and scapular feathers making a big pad on the back. My wing is going to take up most of the side of the body of this. And remember in those that 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 pad of the wing i'm looking at secondary covert feathers and there's going to be a big row of them. there's going to be a smaller row of those. There also is going to be those tertials sticking out the back here. And that will taper my body a little bit. In this bird, there's I'm seeing a little bit of the far wing also sticking out there. That's what we're seeing there. Now, I'm going to give this bird a little bit of some belly feathers. And those legs are walking. OK. Now, if I put my legs too far back, my bird will feel like it's flipping forward. If I put my legs too far forward, it's going to feel like it's falling back. I want to imagine this bird, the center of its gravity. 
Imagine the center of gravity of this bird. If you carve this out of wood, I think I could probably balance it somewhere around here. And that means that my feet on the ground want to be on either side of this balance point. And then my bird will look balanced. But if they're both on one side here, it'll feel like it's going to fall forward. If they're both on this side here, it'll feel like it's going to fall back. And here's a, a great trick to do. I'm going to look on this belly. Where does that first leg come down? It's going to come down somewhere in here. So notice how much leg you see there. Now, look at the negative space between those legs. Let's draw that. Let's draw not, just don't draw in that other leg, but draw what is the shape of the air here between these legs. So I'm actually not really looking at that leg as I'm drawing the other one. And now I can fill those out a little bit more. Widening at that joint. Widening at that joint. And now I have these That helps me just sort of block that bird in. But notice it started with that kind of line across the back. So this bird all of a sudden spots something moving in front of it. And now it changes its pose. So what I want you to do is first, let's pet the bird. Just reach your hand up and feel this line coming down here and across this back. The back is now much more flat here. And we're going to swoop down like that. So with your hand, pet the bird, feel those angles. And now let's let's see if we can put that 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 shape in just the shape of the back. So I'm looking at the shape of the back of the bird. And once I've got that, I can then say, all right, you've got a head. And your little, your little beaky bits. Don't, don't, don't do this. Don't, don't go, here's your head. And then your neck comes out here. You want a little bit of throat before that neck starts. Now, I want to keep my neck at the part first part here skinny, and then their negative shape tucks up. So my wing is going to be taking up a big area here. Again, that's all my area of secondary coverts. I'm going to have my little pad of 
tertials sticking out behind that. There's the other side of the wing. And now where's my, my, my leg, the base of my legs? I'm going to start it here. It's going to come down. It's going to come forward. Now I want, what's the shape of the air behind that? Want a little bit more space in there. There we go. And this one I want higher, this one I want lower. Now on this, the bird's about to change its position, but what I'd like you to do is when you see this new position, I'm gonna ask you to, in your head, pet the bird a few times and then just make one fast, really fast, continuous line to try to get the shape of that neck. Ready? Go, right? First, pet the bird, feel that, feel that. Okay, feel that, feel that, feel that. All right, there, that, yep, yep, yep. And now, on your piece of paper, just kind of go, you. And once you've got that line, that line of action really helps you just be able to carve that bird. I think that this probably deserves a special little discussion about what's going on with the wing. Remember, we had our wing all the way up here. Now, all of a sudden, the wing is doing this weird thing where it's out. So wings have bones in them, just like your arm bone. So from a bird's shoulder, you get an elbow, then two bones out, radius and ulna to a wrist, and then you have hand bones that are fused together, a little thumb sticking up. So birds have a shoulder, elbow, wrist, just like you do. And when the wing gets folded up, they do it in an arrangement like this, shoulder, elbow, wrist, and then the hand bone is kind of sticking out like that. So what this bird is doing is it has a shoulder, which is up in here. It has an elbow that is down here, but instead of having that, if this then took its wrist and brought it forward, you'd have that, that wing down in this area. But instead, it's got it sticking out to the side. So it is holding its wrist out like this. And has this little birdie hand like that. So that's why the wing on this thing is down so low. I maybe should have made mine up a little bit closer. And then it has this pad of scapular feathers and um, back mantle feathers here. And in this weird one, in this cool pose here, you also see 
a little bit of the bird's tail. See this little white thing with a thing on top of it? Most birds have a tail that is shaped like this. There is, if here's its body, the back of its body, there is a tail that is sticking out, and there's a little pad of feathers on the top, and there's a little pad of feathers on the bottom. And if they're really long tails, then you see a long tail. These are called the upper and, and, and uh, undertail coverts. And on this, you're seeing just a little bit of tail sticking out here with some undertail coverts. It also probably wouldn't hurt just to mention this strange red spot here and this strange black spot in the wings. What are those? To do that, it's going to, to, to help to go back to, oh, this is kind of fun. Look here on the side of the body, you can see it's black spot up there. So what are this, these things here? Let's just go back for a minute. Do, 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 up to that flying bird right there. Notice that right here at the wrist, there's a little red spot on its waist. And below that is this strange pad of feathers right there. I didn't mention this before because it just felt like it was making everything too complex. This is a pad of feathers that's attached to the bird's thumb. Right, remember that little thumb that was sticking up here? All right, that's called the allula. So on, uh, on this, there, the bird has this little pad of feathers that attaches to its thumb. And then on the hand here, um, it has, this is where all the primary feathers attach to the hand, fanning out like that. The secondary feathers attach along this bone here, the ulna, and so they come back straight from that. But this little pad of feathers here can move independently of the rest of the primary feathers. And that is called, that's the allula. And it is, it helps the bird with kind of aerodynamic, uh, the aerodynamics of flight. And if we actually go forward through these, you can see that little red patch and that allula prominently at that little wrist junction. So that's where its wrist is. These are the ones its thumb would be right in here, then all those feathers attached to its thumb. So what you're looking at is on the front edge of this, there's the red patch, whereas the allula, it's hidden, <laughs> right? It's hidden, right? Here, this little black feather that you're seeing sticking out, that's your allula. So knowing that, if you want to kind of add more kind of details to, some of these you can you can say that oh i'm seeing a little bit of my little allula sticking out right there on my bird and right there isn't that fun so all the little marks that you see these are um these are are, are th parts of the anatomy that we can identify if we had x-ray vision, we'd know that there's a hip right in here. This bird has, from its hip bone, it has a little thigh bone that comes forward, a short thigh bone. And from there, um, it has, that's its knee. This is the tibia fibula coming out. And there'd be more leg bone coming down here, but it's hidden in the grass. So there's just this Z pattern in the wing. We're just seeing this much of it though. But that's if you were wondering what's going on with that leg. Nom, 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 nom. 
see what it got. So what I'm hoping is, is that by now looking at, that we can look at this bird and understand its structure a whole lot more. And that can both enhance our appreciation of the bird and our ability to draw it. Let's just make one more sketch here of this pose. I start by petting the bird, and then I'm going to say you have a big S that goes up to a bump and a back. So I'm again starting with just sort of the back shape of that bird and then I'm going to refine it as I I'm going to come down straighter than I drew. I'm going to swing in and make a tight little teardrop. In the front, I'm going to give it a little bit of underside of the head. So I really like looking at where do where do angles sort of change their direction. So sometimes when I'm sketching, I'll make instead of drawing a curved line like that. I'll just sort of sketch in an angle and make them just a little bit more angular than I'm seeing, because that really helps me be able to, 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 to get these uh, kind of inflection points in curves. Here is the big block of my secondary coverts. It's a good idea to check your proportions before you um, <laughs> before you get too far in your picture. You notice on the sketch that I did, I got a big old body and a tiny little neck. Look at look at the one on the screen. You notice it's got a thicker and longer neck proportionate to that body. Uh, there's a tendency to um, when you realize that you made a mistake like that, to go ahead and keep drawing anyway. But then at the end of the day, you still have this bird where its neck is totally out of proportion with the body. So what I will often do when I realize something like that is you can handle it seven, several ways. You can just write neck to short and thin. Draw a little arrow over to it. That way you can use your words just to, 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 to help you get that. Another strategy is just to, to just on the same page, start a new drawing, right? And this time try to get it a little bit better. And if you do that, you are you're uh, you're not locked into these sort of proportion things. It's a good strategy to once you kind of lightly get something blocked in, check your proportions before you start your heavy lines. Here I didn't do that and I paid the price, but it's okay because it's it's all practice. It's by making a bunch of drawings like this, you're going to get better and better, and. Um, and that is, is, and it makes a huge difference. If you want to get better at drawing herons, go to some place where there are a bunch of herons and spend some quality time with them. Um, 
Also, you can consider um, while you're, if you're going to be doing that, what if you also participated in some of the citizen science projects that are going on with the um, San Francisco Bay uh, Bird Observatory? So you can um, consider um, getting involved in a citizen science project. And it's a really fun way to meet other people. As you're out sketching and enjoying nature, you can be contributing to our scientific understanding of birds in this area. And so if there's a, 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 a heronry near where uh, you live, you can become one of the regular monitors of these. And I think that if you do that, um, it just sort of, it adds a an additional sense of connection and purpose to when we are out exploring. And I hope that some of these strategies that you've seen today can help you get that heron that you see down onto your little piece of paper and might motivate you to say like, hey, that's really fun. I think I'm going to go draw some herons while I'm at that why don't I see what I can do to also become a heron monitor? We can all make a difference. And then we have scientific data to inform, to inform our, um, our, our conservation practices. So I'd love to bring in the uh, team from San Francisco Bay Bird Observatory again and, and turn it back over to our SFBBO team. Thank you so much, Jack. That was such a wonderful class. I'm seeing lots of comments. Um, people are saying they'll never look at a hair in the same way again. It's, it's really wonderful. Thank you so much. So informative, um, and not just with the drawing, but just understanding the anatomy of the bird and better understanding how they actually work, which is amazing. So thank you so much for that. That was absolutely fantastic. Well, my, I'm, I'm delighted to be here um, with you again. again SFBBO is um, you guys are really making a, a difference in, in uh, our local bird conservation. So I'm really honored to have a chance to come here and geek out with all of you. And yeah. also just wanna thank uh, all my friends for coming and, and joining me this evening. Um, it is really, it's, it's, it's a delight to see all of you here and I really appreciate you taking your time. Yes, thank you everybody so much for attending. It's been great. Um, I love all of the comments and all the questions that have come in. It's been really great to have you all. So we really appreciate you. Thank you for your support too, especially to everybody who donated. Um, as I mentioned, we are a small nonprofit. This event is run entirely by donations. Um, our Colonial Waterbird Program is also run by donations. So we do really appreciate your support. And if you'd like to get involved, please get in touch, uh, visit our website. And of course, please also contribute to Jack as well. Um, he does this uh, and makes them available free of charge to people as well. And he does all kinds of other uh, nature journaling uh, classes, drawing classes. And so definitely check those out as well if you aren't already doing that. The, um, why don't we uh, drop the uh, uh, DP, thank you so much for donating to SFBBO. That's great. Um, want to, uh, let's, let's put the donation uh, link for S S SFBBO into the chat so people can find that. Um, and the, uh, and, and again, this is a, an, an organization that does really wonderful stuff with the, the, the funding that they get. Um, and want to encourage people, if you are, are able to um, at this time, to, to support them, to please do. But I understand you know, lots of people are, ah, oh, there's the, there it is. Um, um, lots of people are, these are economically strange times. Um, but there's lots of other ways to get involved with bird conservation in your area. So if you're in the San Francisco Bay area, you're like, oh, okay, this is great. But there's a lot of people here. I saw a person in the um, their group for as far away as, as, as Singapore. And so of course, <laughs> you're not gonna be able to volunteer with this group. 
But what bird conservation, what citizen science projects are there going on in your area? Um, really want to encourage um, to encourage people to find those and and get involved. It's really a it's it's a it's a wonderful way to connect with the natural world. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Jack, for sharing that. And of course, for again, for this event and your support. Um, and thank you again, everybody, for your support as well and for joining us tonight. We really do appreciate you all. Thank you so much. Hey, Kelsey, thank you so much for staying up late with us. And I hope you had a really good time. Mm -hmm.